Okay, thank you everybody for coming this evening. It's good to see everyone. Welcome. I am Professor Maya Cross. I am Director of the Center for International Affairs and World Cultures and also Professor of Political Science and International Affairs. Um, so the mission of this center is, which is obviously housed within the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, is to enrich and support scholarship and timely analysis on how fostering international cooperation, empathy, and mutual understanding contrib contribute to solving global challenges. The panel today is part of one of our center's speaker series called the Global Crisis Series, and it's designed to address events and challenges of the moment as they're occurring around the world. So I'm really happy to introduce the Associate Director of the Center, Professor Gretchen Hefner, who um, she's going to be introducing our panel briefly and also uh, moderating our discussion as well as the Q&A, which will happen after the panelists um, kick things off. So Gretchen, thank you. Thank you. I'm actually going to stand up here too so I don't have to hold a mic in my face real quick. <laughs> um, so thank you, Maya, and thank you everyone for coming. It's um, Delighted to see you all uh, who are here in the audience um, and also those of you who can join us online. What I thought I would do is just kind of give you a sense of what the next hour and 15 minutes will look like <laughs> and then sort of jump into it. Um, we'll have the panelists, our sort of distinguished panelists, speak for about 30 minutes. Um, I'll ask them a few questions um, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A. And so for those of you who are in the room, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and I'll come around with a mic um, that you'll have to speak right into. Um, for those of you online, you're welcome to post questions in the chat function and our colleague Diana will um, provide those for us um, in the room. So that's kind of what things will look like. Um, we're here today, of course, um, because a full year has passed since Russia invaded neighboring Ukraine, an operation which um, Moscow and many military leaders assumed would be over quite quickly. Uh, that is not obviously how things turned out. Twelve months after the conflict started, the front lines have stiffened, and here we are, sort of 372 days into it. The most intimate and devastating effects have obviously been borne by the Ukrainian people. Cities and towns have been flattened by artillery and missile strikes. Tens of thousands of civilians have lost their lives and been injured, and some 8 million Ukrainians um, are considered refugees at this point, nearly 20% of the population. But the consequences, of course, have been felt around the world. And I think for those of you here, we know over the past year there's been periodic stories about sort of possible economic effects of the war, including rising fuel and food prices. There's been clear implications for American foreign policy. Of course, President Biden, um, as many of you probably know, was in Kyiv last week, uh, asserting American support for more arms and aid to Ukraine. Um, the Secretary of State Blinken has been touring around the world, shoring up support for sanctions. New tensions with China um, have emerged around the issue of their support for Moscow and for the war. Uh, of course, the conflict, as it continues, has sort of demonstrated um, a host of conflicts and issues and consequences around the world, which many of our panelists will talk about tonight. Um, stability in Europe, right? the future of NATO, the health of democracies around the world. These are all issues that I think we'll address and I encourage you to inquire about um, if they're of interest to you and you want to learn more about them. So our four distinguished panelists, as I mentioned, will um, provide background based on their area of expertise. I'm going to ask them a few questions um, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Um, so who are they? <laughs> I'll introduce them in order that they'll be speaking. Come on in, it's okay. Um, Ole Katsuba is a scholar of literature and culture and the manager of publications at Harvard University's Ukraine Research Institute, where he directs several book series and scholarly monographs in Ukrainian studies and translations of documents and literature from the Ukraine and, and um, edits a peer-reviewed scholarly journal the Harvard, called Harvard Ukrainian Studies. Maya Cross, who um, you sort of already met and she introduced herself a bit, is of course the Dean's Professor of Political Science, International Affairs, and Diplomacy here at Northeastern, and she's the Director of the Center for International Affairs and World Cultures. Julie Gary is an Associate Teaching Professor of Political Science, also here at Northeastern, and is the Director of Security and Resilience Studies programs um, in CSSH. And then finally at the end we have Steve Lynn, who's a Professor of Political Science and the Founding Director of the Global Resilience Institute, also here at Northeastern. <laughs> 
Um, so what I wanted to do is sort of turn over the mic to, 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 to Ole um, to answer the first question. <laughs> um, it's kind of a question that it's going to seem deceptively simple, um, and I expect all the panelists to sort of answer it based on their area of expertise. Um, and the question is, why does this matter? Right? Why does a war that's been going on for a year so far away matter? Um, why should we care about it? Thank you so much. Thank you for introduction, and thank you all for being here, despite the fact that it's uh, kind of getting late for <laughs> some of us. Um, it's wonderful that so many of you are interested in what is going on in Ukraine, and I think for you, perhaps the question why it matters may seem self-evident, but for many people that we ha get to talk uh, about in our work and as well as in our daily lives, sometimes that is not as evident, so I appreciate the question. Um, I'm Ukrainian myself. I uh, was born and grew up in Ukraine. Af after that, I left for Germany, where I studied, and then I came here. And so I have a lot of personal connections as well as professional and family uh, connections to Ukraine. And so I hear firsthand how people experience what is going on on the ground in Ukraine. And it's terrifying. And so I think that uh, kind of the simple answer to why it matters is that um, human suffering matters, and it doesn't matter where it is. Uh, human suffering in Syria matters. Human suffering uh, in World War II matters. Human suffering today in Ukraine matters. Um, and uh, of course, when we look at what is uh, going on in Ukraine today, there are many stories that are to kind of do not make it into the American media. Um, and a lot of um, kind of events on the ground that people experience are not, uh, are not known outside of Ukraine or, or especially the United States. Uh, one such fact, for example, is that, as you may know, the uh, economy uh, of the United States during the Great Depression fell by about 35 percent, the GDP, right? And you might have studied what a great tragedy it was for families, for people, and how much pain and suffering it brought. Well, in the past year alone, uh, Ukraine's economy fell by 44 percent. And uh, just imagine what, what that brings in addition to losing your home, losing your job, losing your maybe your loved ones. Um, so all of that is still going on. Many people are displaced. Uh, children are separated from their parents. Uh, uh, so male Ukrainians uh, aged 16 through 60 uh, actually cannot leave the country and have to stay behind just in case they would be called up to serve and defend the country. And so many women uh, who were able to leave have taken their children and left the country. And so these families have been separated for a year, for example. Uh, others have been injured or maimed, and it's very difficult to, um, of course, to get any medical service if uh, Russia is uh, bombing critical infrastructure such as electricity substations, such as um, uh, electric power plants, and kind of all kinds of other infrastructure. And so that, in addition to everything, of course, makes it much more difficult. Uh, of course, there are many other e reasons why uh, something like this matters. Um, and um, for us here, we are pretty far removed from what is going on in Ukraine. But I think it also matters because we all need to uh, uh, try to develop empathy for other peoples, not just for ourselves. We often tend to be very focused on our own issues. Uh, however, if we, if we are able to step outside of ourselves and look at others, that of course helps us uh, develop a better understanding of who the other people are. Thank you. So <coughs> after those really important comments, I'm going to just kind of zoom slightly out to the European region and talk about my area of expertise, which is the EU. And <clears throat> essentially what I would say is looking back at this past year, one of the key takeaways, one of the, the big things I would emphasize about how this matters and, and what it shows about Europe and the European Union is that it is really fundamentally committed to democracy and upholding the liberal international order. So I think when you look at what happened, you know, and, and Europe has long had this kind of reputation of being in existential crisis on the verge of breaking apart, that when really put to the test with something like Ukraine and the need to dramatically transform so many policies overnight, 
the EU did come together and speak with one voice. It, it wasn't necessarily easy, and I'm thinking in particular of Hungary, which still kind of drags its feet today. But it, it actually was able to sign multiple rounds of, of intensive sanctions regimes. It was able to overcome difficulties in internal diplomacy, like with countries like Hungary that actually had tried to nurture a relationship with Russia prior to the war and to some extent even now. It had to transform economic policy overnight. Um, so I think that it shows that the EU fundamentally sees what's going on in Ukraine as also about the future of the EU and the West. Um, and there's a couple of things I would just kind of highlight. One example, sort of thinking beyond um, the sanctions regime that I already mentioned, the transfer of money and aid that has come in, in large quantities, not just from the U US, but also from Europe, um, including weaponry, is that it was able to rapidly reduce reliance um, a large part of the reliance on Russian energy. And this was thought to be almost impossible before the war. So I think it's worth really paying attention to that. And one silver lining of this is actually that the EU has shot way beyond its climate change um, goals. So it had stated a goal that by 2030, it would have 40% um, of its energy coming from renewables. It's already exceeded that, and it's headed toward probably 50% by 2030. Um, a lot of this has been, you know, basically in response to trying to come up with alternatives to Russian energy, and so solar has just shot past double what the expectations were. Um, so that's just one example of the kind of transformation that Europe underwent specifically in order to support Ukraine, um, and I think. The second thing I would mention is just how strong the transatlantic alliance has proven to be. And I know that Julie, my colleague, will also address this looking at NATO. But um, you know, before the invasion, uh, it was very common to talk about the shaky ground and the decline of the transatlantic alliance, also of Europe. Um, but clearly, we can see now that this is a big priority for European countries and for the US, and that it really has some staying power. Um, it also extends beyond the transatlantic relationship, as we saw with the UN vote recently, 141 countries condemning what Russia has done. Um, but I think really um, what stands out to me is the humanitarian, financial, military contributions coordinated across um, the Atlantic. Uh, so I think right now it would be very difficult to say that you know the West is in serious decline or that somehow you know it is unwilling to stand together <coughs> to uphold um, liberal international principles. Thank you, Maya. Yes, she definitely touched on some points that I feel I'm going to parrot uh, in talking about NATO. Um, and I see so many of my students in the audience right now that I'm almost tempted to hand them the microphone because they are probably, uh, not only if they heard this, but they might be even more qualified to talk about some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, it's important to note that, of course, the EU is not NATO. NATO is not the EU. NATO is also not EU members plus the United States and Canada. Um, they are distinct organizations. And in thinking about changes that have occurred as a result of the last year to NATO, um, sometimes it's helpful to think about NATO. And sometimes I think about NATO in the context of US-NATO relations. Um, so some of what I'm about to say will probably reflect that just a little bit. Um, you know, the alliance over the last year, it, it's hard not to look at what has happened really since 2014 as um, a watershed moment for the alliance, right? It was, um, in many regards, having a bit of an existential crisis, or some saw it as being um, in this period where some allies were questioning its utility, some allies were questioning whether it should withstand this new environment, the 21st century, um, and some were questioning how it should understand its relationship with Russia. Uh, if you are familiar with NATO at all, if you've studied it in any of your classes, you've probably heard the famous 1949 quote that NATO was intended to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. And at the end of the Cold War, um, scholars and practitioners, policymakers, and citizens of NATO states said, 
why are we still doing this? Why are we not um, recreating or reimagining European security? And what are the consequences of this? And there's been lots of talk, um, particularly since 2022, whether these moments were um, pivotal in Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Um, but in terms of the last year specifically, um, you know, the changes to the alliance have been material, they've been military, they've been political, they've been economic. There is really no corner um, that has been left untouched by the war and by the Allies' responses to it. Uh, of course, uh, Allies have increased their contributions to their own defense, as particular allies like Poland, Estonia, Latvia have dealt with not only concerns about their ability to withstand an attack from Russia, but also dealing with the humanitarian crisis. Poland alone, I think, um, houses more than a million and a half refugees from Ukraine, and NATO has been instrumental in supporting its allies in doing so. Um, there's also been renewed unity within the alliance. Um, one of the things that was, I, I frequently found myself debunking during the Trump administration concerned how much allies were contributing to their own defense and to the NATO alliance. Um, those, some of those problems have subsided uh, in light of um, states taking seriously the threat that Russia still poses to them. Some of my students were recently, I was in a briefing with um, officials from the Lithuanian embassy in the US and, and he said to, to me and to my students, it really stood out to me and has stuck in my mind ever since. He said, we didn't need Ukraine to know the threat that Russia poses and we know the value of being a member of NATO. And there are probably some allies who before 2014 or 2022 kind of, uh, took that for granted as the alliance turned its attention to other areas of interest, other concerns, other threats. Uh, but 2022 certainly refocused the alliance. Um, and that's not to say that there isn't continued discord. I, I anticipate hopefully a few questions maybe about that and we can talk through that. Um, but they are in, in many regards more united than they were in 2022. And I think that is significant. Great, I'm gonna focus my uh, um, comments on what we're looking at a year after uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine around some of the implications for the broader international system. Uh, it turned out just before the invasion, I was asked to chair a National Academies Committee to looking at the risk of, of nuclear terrorism. And uh, at the time, it seemed like, well, this was kind of a below the radar screen sort of issue. But one of the graver implications of what's happened uh, over the last year is essentially the foundations for managing the nuclear age have really started to come undone. It was an extraordinary part of the post-Cold War history after the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union imploded that Russia really became an ally in trying to manage the issues of counterproliferation and non-proliferation and also the degree to which the arms control agreements brought down massive arsenals that the United States and Russia had at the end of the Cold War down to much lower range, where the goal was to try to get to zero. Now, we never made it there, but now those norms that have helped us manage the nuclear age have largely come undone because Russia is talking about the use of nuclear weapons in ways that were pretty much forbidden by the great powers. Nuclear weapons were basically something that were, you know, came out of the Second World War, that were built up during the Cold War, but they were for deterrence. They were not, they didn't have relevant military application. Well, Putin has sort of changed that, not just the rhetoric, but increasingly sort of nudged the world to say, yeah, there might be some use for these. And that is something that should give us all some concern. Also, the arms control agreements we had were already fading uh, because of the stress in between U.S. and Russian relationships. But as we heard just last week, the final one we had, the New START agreement, has been tossed out. But the implications are significant as well in terms of that many of the ways in which we've managed nonproliferation have been managed at the United Nations, at the international organization level. And Russia is basically exercising both its veto and the Security Council and just not being supportive in lots of other ways that are really starting to make that a challenge. This is happening at the very same time, almost somewhat ironically, that to get to the green goals, the zero carbon goals, we have to see a massive expansion 
in the civil nuclear sector. And so we're likely to see much more nuclear energy uh, ha showing up in places it's never been before. And again, one uh, sobering implication of what's happened in Russia is the targeting of those nuclear facilities and, now the, and the occupation of those facilities. But the raising those up as potentially targets of war is certainly a concern in the U.S. in the current context of, of Ukraine, but also the degree that as nuclear energy likely finds itself in much smaller forms, modular forms, and other ways spreading around the planet, the materials to support it start getting more difficult to control. And the breakdown of an international regime to manage those risks is something that really should give us all some pause. So that is something that's very much in play. We were rather dozy about the nuclear age here for pretty much the last 20 years. It seemed like that was pretty much under control. But we're now in an environment where that, unfortunately, is starting to nudge up. On the other end of the spectrum, i just like to share you know, one of the implications that I think has got less attention than it needs to get, which is Russia's use of food as a weapon. Ukraine is the birdbasket of the world. It's played that extraordinary role throughout our history. But basically, the implosion of the Ukrainian economy, in particular its agricultural export uh, part, has real implications for the developing world. All of the places that basically are scariest right now in terms of civil instability and, um, and, and refugee related issues like Afghanistan and Yemen and Somalia and the greater Horn of Africa, food is one of the core issues. Their diets are primarily grain based. And so when we disrupt that food supply as has happened over the last year, and continues to happen, not just because of the war in Ukraine, but because of Russia's basically dragging its heels on inspections for the protocol that was put in place to allow ships to move out of the Black Sea, keeping those prices high. The estimates by the United Nations are that there are about 330 million people on the planet who are basically starving. They don't get near enough food to meet what is the daily nourishment requirements. This war, at a minimum, has added 30 more million to that list. Those are sobering numbers. So broadly, we're in a world here where some of the things that we relied on to manage risk, you know, the nuclear one at the very high end of security, but issues like managing food and deprivation, you know, that, that regime is starting to come unglued. And of course, where that has real impact, not just for the United States, but for the world, is the refugees that likely happen when states fail, when economies fail. And that's something we'll have to wrestle with in the years to come. Thank you all. Um, I have a question that I think I will ask you to refine a bit some of what you all have been saying, um, which is amazing and I think super generative, I hope, for everyone um, in the audience thinking about what's going on right now, um, which is sort of what has been learned, <laughs> right? Um, and what can we and should we do going forward? And I mean that literally individually, if you want to answer on an individual level, but also in terms of the institutions, the states, the international regimes that we've been talking about. Um, what are the sort of next steps? Um, I, think, I think that from the Ukrainian perspective, Ukraine has learned many bitter lessons uh, in this past year. Lesson number one pertains to the nuclear threat. Uh, Ukraine has made an unprecedented step in 1994 when uh, it gave up the third largest nuclear arsenal at the time, which Ukraine inherited after the collapse of the Soviet Union and which uh, Ukrainian specialists and factories participated in building. And so, of course, because Ukraine is also home to Chernobyl, to the largest nuclear disaster in human history, the sentiment uh, among the population was that, uh, you know, we wanted to distance ourselves from the Soviet Union in that way and get rid of the nuclear weapons. So 5,000 uh, nuclear uh, weapons were uh, given to Russia, and then Russia also was one of the guarantors of Ukraine's sovereignty and um, integrity. And so the lesson learned here was that um, these kind of international agreements have very little val value if you don't have the nukes. And so I think that many uh, countries will definitely think twice or more than twice before giving up anything. And so w if we're looking at Iran, if we're looking at North Korea, I think the likelihood of them uh, you know, giving up any kind of nuclear weapons has decreased significantly after this year. Um, 
uh, number two, of course, the, um, I think the second learning is that uh, Ukrainian uh, concerns for security have been dismissed or downplayed by Western partners. And uh, uh, very early uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine expressed concerns about a possible attack by Russia and had asked to be kind of faster integrated into, into the West, economically and politically, but also to be provided uh, more of kind of um, regular military capabilities, so non-nuclear capabilities, uh, conventional weapons basically, that would have compensated for the loss of such a powerful deterrent as nuclear weapons. Um, and that was also not the case. Uh, in fact, Ukraine even paid for the majority of the dismantling of the nuclear weapons itself. Um, and so kind of the third learning, uh, I think, of this past year is that you have to rely on yourself. Uh, you have to uh, be resilient and creative, and Ukrainians have shown an incredible resilience and creativity uh, in uh, fighting uh, the Russians uh, by all means necessary. Um, and um, also kind of trying to reform themselves and trying to kind of overcome some of the issues that um, that have emerged as a result of the war, right? And one of them is also the strength of the democratic institutions. Because in a, in a situation of a war, uh, there is a very strong temptation to give up on some of the uh, institutions of kind of democratic government that are useful and are known to be effective in peaceful time, right? And so there is a very strong kind of predilection for a strong leader and so on. And so for, I mean, we ha all ha have to admire President Zelensky, of course, for what he has done, but the danger is great that, you know, power may corrupt him and his government. And so that's a also a great challenge that is emerging right now. Uh, and finally, the last, probably the last um, uh, learning is um, kind of concern and, and um, fear of sorts, what will happen to Russia after this? Uh, already now, as, as you may know, there are uh, a dozen, at least if not more, private uh, military companies in Russia. So basically private armies that are owned by Prigozhin, one of the oligarchs, or the Minister of Defense, Shoigu, and others. Um, and so it speaks to the fact that these people are preparing for the possible scenario of a kind of a tumultuous time after the war in which they would be players for power, either uh, a kind of power um, you know, in all of Russia or regional power, because we don't know what may happen if the regions may have their own ambitions for independence or autonomy. Um, and um, because Putin's power for the first time has been undermined as a result of this war, and the failures and the weakness of the army that has been exhibited. And so these kind of people around him who are fighting and vying for power, they're getting ready for something dramatic. And so what that means for Ukraine, for Europe, and for the world is kind of the, la the la probably the, the biggest worry too. Okay. So thinking about this question, which is a great question from, <laughs> from the EU's perspective, I think there are some, there are certainly some lessons to be learned here, but it is, is actually a little more complex than I think has been characterized oftentimes in the media. So there's often a narrative that, you know, European countries were just benefiting or free riding off of the US security umbrella. And so they find themselves woefully underprepared for this situation they find themselves in. And it is, it is clear that, especially with the promises of tanks that was made most recently, that the capacity for territorial defense uh, on the part of the Europeans is even less than they themselves thought. But the reason why it is also a complex situation is that they were actually purposefully moving away from territorial defense, and I think probably for good reason at the time. They were doing this for at least a decade, but what they envisioned was in a world in which there were more institutions ensuring peace, the, the types of crises they would be involved in would be m multinational, rapid reaction, and humanitarian. And they were absolutely preparing for this through integration of their own forces so that they could contribute to world order and humanitarian efforts all over the world. Um, so when this happened um, in Ukraine, they suddenly were found in a position of having to pivot back towards an older system of global relations that they thought was pretty much over. 
So I think that now there's a scramble to think about territorial defense back on the table in Europe, and specifically that Russia is going to be a security threat for the foreseeable future. Not, a, not an incredibly strong one, but still nonetheless, it will be part of foreign policy calculations in security and defense. But also that Ukraine is, is almost permanently part of now the European security architecture. And it's more than just security, it will be part of politics and economics as well. But for sure, in terms of this war, Ukraine is now part of Europe. Um, and membership in the EU will take time, but it is definitely not something the Europeans uh, can ignore. So I think overall, the lesson is going forward, the EU does have to actually be very ambitious in its strategic vision. Um, if we look at recent documents and planning that the EU has released, such as the str strategic compass or even before that, um, the global strategy, these tended to kind of bind its ambition into smaller and smaller, more regional levels. And I think the lesson here is that, you know, the EU has often been at its most successful when it has big ideas, when it's ambitious, when it's aspirational, and when it thinks globally. It's less successful when it tends to think narrowly and incrementally. And so uh, this lesson, I think, is really driven home in, in facing this sort of unanticipated um, invasion uh, in Ukraine. And I think that really for the future, the EU had launched the European Defense Union before the war, and that has to be front and center going forward and in a way that includes uh, Ukraine. In thinking about this question, I am drawn to bring in the 2022 strategic concept, which is one of the highest level documents um, guiding NATO's um, policy and planning. In that document, NATO stated it reaffirmed its commitment to what it sees as three core pillars of the organization, which are deterrence and defense, crisis management, and uh, collective security. I think that the last year has taught the alliance or the lesson that the alliance has drawn from the last year, one of the biggest ones has been um, to really place emphasis on the deterrence and defense pillar of the organization. Um, I think that also the alliance is learning about the consequences of integration. There has been a lot of discussion about the consequences of NATO expansion, but even if we look to not so much new members of NATO, but NATO's partnerships, the ways in which Ukraine was, I, again, parroting what Maya has said, the way that Ukraine was brought uh, into NATO's sphere after the 2014 annexation of Crimea in terms of strengthening its armed forces, preparing for a conventional war, thinking about how it would operate with the NATO allies and with the NATO alliance as a whole, um, thinking about the consequences of that and thinking about um, any direction that NATO takes is not happening in a vacuum or not happening um, with an eye towards where the future threat is coming from, um, but also with an eye towards where have previous threats come from and do those threats persist. I also think that the Alliance, again, has taken a more comprehensive approach to moving towards um, adopting new measures for institutional resilience and thinking about resilience um, more comprehensively than it had before 2022 or before it had um, in, in the last few years. So thinking about things like democratic backsliding amongst NATO member states, thinking about democratic backsliding in partner states or thinking about it in other areas of the globe, thinking about, again, continued integration of capabilities and resources, thinking about the ability to uh, respond to what we're seeing, as Steve was talking about earlier, um, things like the energy crises, thinking about the consequences of having these complex relationships with states outside of the alliance and what it means when you are faced with periods of crisis, um, but also in periods of peace, how you're thinking about ensuring the alliance can do what it intends to do uh, in, the, in those important moments. So one of the things that we're learning is actually something we have to keep relearning, which is wars are really messy and they get messier the longer they go. And one of the things that's certainly worrisome here is when you basically have a war that goes beyond a year, 
um, they almost never get over very much quickly after that. Um, so we're really probably talking about a multi-year conflict. We can potentially see in the nearer term that uh, Ukraine may actually be able to push Russia back. It seems clear that that's just throwing lots of troops, particularly un relatively untrained, you know, is very deadly for those troops and have not been successful to the point that that's sort of very much to be played out over the next few months. As Ukraine gets more weapons, it will be in a better position to, you know, push back and, pu and push uh, Russia further. But also, as long as Putin is uh, running Russia, it seems very clear that he's not likely to throw in the towel on this. So we're probably in for a very, very long haul. The one area that gets me most concerned with respect to Ukraine is something I'm worried about more broadly uh, with any advanced uh, society, is, uh, is basically the uh, targeting Russia has had of the electric grid. We've mentioned it was really well uh, before. There is a tipping point where you can bring the grid down. And when you do that, it basically, when it goes dark, we basically requires a black start. That's about a, usually, many weeks and so it can be several months to get the grid back up again. This would be happen if it was true in the United States. If the grid basically goes down, you need power to get it back up. And the process of restart once you go dark is, is a months long process. So it's hard to imagine how people could occupy a city in a place where you have no power. Actually, the biggest impact is usually wastewater. Right? It's, a, it's sort of water, the basic element of life, but also the wastewater piece basically feeds disease and all the rest of it here. When you lose basically power, you lose access to basically many of these foundations we take very much for granted. And it's been nothing short of miraculous from my perspective how well the Ukrainians have been able to constantly keep this thing going. They're putting Cuban mechanics to shame. <laughs> their, their dexterity at being able to keep old systems somehow up and running and repaired is really quite extraordinary. But I was quick when we we do a lot of pressure on the Germans about the tanks. I was like, put the Germans to work on substations. Put them to work on transformers. We need to mobilize to basically be able to build that civil infrastructure. So one very messy element of warfare as we're seeing it is the targeting of critical infrastructure. And a line between military and civilian basically just disappears. Other key blurring area that we're also seeing is we often, often view uh, warfare in the context of state versus non-state. Terrorism has often been viewed as a non-state actor role and then state's warfare. These are, as we see, artifices. When increasingly that line is being blurred, as we're seeing with the Wagner Group and other militias and so forth being bought in to you essentially have organized crime playing a warfare-like role. You have terrorists in the mix. Terrorists can be sponsored by states. All this is getting much blurrier than we're set up to deal with. We often have dealt with terrorism as largely a law enforcement kind of sets of issues that with good intelligence and good law enforcement, you can, you can try to at least contain it. But when we basically are talking about states using it as a form of asymmetric warfare and targeting society, so it's a much mess, messier world. All screaming for us to make sure we have a good international regime that will basically help us manage these risks. The thing that most keeps me awake at night is not necessarily what Russia is doing, what Ukraine is doing, what Europe is doing, but what's happening here in America. And the concern here that we may move into this increasingly isolationist-like mode here that we pull out in some way or just start losing interest. That will have a ripple effect on, on wh where things go. It will send the signal to not just Russia but also to China. And the expectation that there would be more unanimity around this is something that I've seen have been sadly dashed in, um, and certainly in the, over the last few months and in recent weeks. And I very much hope that cooler heads will prevail and we'll keep on track. Thank you. Um, you. You sort of began answering my final question that I'll have you all briefly weigh in on before we open it up to questions. Um, it's the kind of crystal ball question of like, what's next? And and you have a grim, <laughs> a rather grim I'll view of it. But I'm curious about um, 
how this might end, if any of you have a sense of that. Again, this is the crystal ball question. We, we're not going to hold you to whatever your answer is. Um, but how might it end or what, what might happen in the coming year? Um, that's, of course, hard to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, ca I can say what kind of what the sentiment is, perhaps. Um, one of the one of the um, kind of mysteries for many Western observers or or experts or even governments has been the Ukrainian resilience. L literally, not just Russia, but also many many uh, Western partners and allies of Ukraine have expected that the country would fall within three days, or that the capital will be taken within two weeks, or something like that. That's why. You know, uh, certain partners uh, tried to evacuate President Zelensky when he said his famous quote, right? I don't need a ride, I need, <laughs> I need ammunition, <laughs> right? But the reality is that uh, it's the people uh, who kind of, who hold up the sky, right? And that's the, that's the name of a recent exhibition that is right now taking place at the MFA, who holds up the sky about documenting the war in Ukraine. Um, it's the people, and even if Zelensky made some kind of a deal with the Russian government, people would not stop fighting because they're fighting for their livelihood. For Ukrainians, it's a generational struggle. It's a generational fight for survival. We feel like we have been at this for so long. We have experienced so much abuse and, and torture and rape and everything from Russians that if we give up again, then we better peri perish. And uh, it's a fight for our people who are on the occupied territories, not so much for the lands. Who cares about the lands? If Russia could take a chunk of the land and just and 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 just leave Ukraine in peace, people would have agreed to that. But everyone understands that it's not about a piece of land. Um, and so, people right now in uh, eastern Ukraine, in the uh, Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts, as well as in the uh, uh, in the Crimea are being held in illegal prisons. They're being tortured there, mutilated, raped, killed without any lawful process, without any really kind of uh, uh, order of sorts. There is no law. And that's what, that's what we are fighting against. Uh, we're fighting for uh, values. And that's, uh, that may sound trivial of sorts, but it's very real when you're faced with it. Uh, people have endured this winter without electricity, hot water, running water, uh, you know, anything they have, they have, they often they had two hours of electricity in the middle of the night. So everyone would jump up, do the laundry, cook food for two days, you know, do whatever they needed to do for the kids. And they endured and they refused to give, give up their apartments. Like my uncle <laughs> in Mykolaiv in the southern city uh, on the Black Sea who said, I, I built this house over the last 20 years. I'm not giving this up simply because someone said they want this land, you know. And he was sitting in the corner. The house doesn't have a basement, unfortunately, because the soil is very rocky. It's kind of on the sea level. So he would be sitting in the corner and not moving from there and say, OK, if the house collapses, I have higher chances of surviving sitting in the corner. If you listen to someone talking like that to your uncle, you get goosebumps. And you realize that you know these people would rather die than give up. So that is a very important, uh, I, I think, thing to remember. So from the Ukrainian perspective, all of the uh, 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 polls and everything show that over 85% and 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 sometimes over 90% of people believe that Ukraine be will be victorious in this struggle. And uh, how they estimate it is be based on the motivation, not just of Ukrainians but also of Russians. Russians. The Russian troops, they don't know what they're fighting for. When they are captured and then interviewed or interrogated, very often they say, well, I, I didn't even know I was in Ukraine. I thought we were in some kind of exercises. It may be not true in some cases. I think that may be also a learned li line to kind of try and protect themselves. But the reality is they don't know what really they're, they're fighting for. Putin has tried to portray this as kind of uh, um, uh, fighting the neo-Nazism in Ukraine, which is ridiculous, of course, and uh, any kind of thinking individual understands that. Uh, Ukraine is the only country outside of Israel that has a Jewish president. <laughs> United States has done ma managed to do that, right? And no other country. We had a prime minister who was Jewish and openly acknowledged that and so on. So, of course, there's always issues with anti-Semitism in every country, but Ukraine is not, you know, there's not no kind of neo-Nazi regime. Anyway, so, that's one. Number two, 
a, a lot really depends on how Russia is doing economically and, and, and socially. Uh, Russian economy, in comparison to Ukraine's economy, has only lost 3.5% as the result of all the sanctions. And that's nothing. Uh, people who have you know, family or friends in Russia tell me that life goes on as usual. People in big cities in particular don't notice anything. They have their parties, they have their jobs, they go to school, they go to university and so on. Everything that Ukrainians cannot do today. Kids have not been to school in a year sometimes. Universities have been bombed, you know, hospitals, maternity wards, and so on. None of this is visible to the Russians in Russia. Uh, only in the Far East, where all the kind of uh, national minorities and ethnic minorities uh, are kind of, so the Buratia in particular, where the Burats are being uh, drafted into the army, that's where they feel it. But they are far removed from the center and therefore cannot really impact the political goings on in, in Russia. Uh, and so a lot is going to depend whether or not uh, the world finally decides that Russia has to pay the real economic and other, other price for their aggression. They have to be cut out, out of all of these institutions that are benefiting from uh, in the democratic uh, setup of the world. Uh, if they are blocking important decisions on the Security Council of the uh, UN, they have to be removed from the sec uh, Security Council, and so on. All of these things need to happen, and so that my Hope, of course, uh, no one knows how it will happen, but my hope is that the world will realize this more and more as these kind of alliances uh, coagulate and we see that happening already, right? On the one hand, Russia, North Korea, Iran, China right now on defense possibly may supply uh, certain weapons and other um, materials to Russia and so that will be the kind of autocratic alliance and the democratic world on the other hand. And so whether or not the democratic world will allow Russia to benefit from all of these uh, wonderful things that democracies have created, freedom and innovation, you know, development and everything, that's the question to the developed world and the world has to make, has to make a choice. So ultimately with a crystal ball, I would say <laughs> that um, in the medium to long term, Russia has to lose this. I mean, this is definitely crystal ball <laughs> talk, but I would say that there's just, I mean, combined with what Ole said about um, the resilience of the Ukrainian people, and Julie also mentioned, you know, the resilience of the transatlantic alliance and the West, the West can simply not afford to let Russia win no matter what because it's the whole global order that's at stake right now, right? So this is what's what they are ultimately fighting for, not just for the battlefield victory and to protect Ukraine, but for the post-World War II order that recognizes use of, of force as a last resort, diplomacy, cooperation through international institutions, transparency, the rule of law, all of those things that go with liberal internationalism, that is what is at stake. So if the West has to ratchet up eventually, if it even has to, God forbid, enter the war um, with troops on the ground, at some point it has to do whatever it takes to defeat Russia, even if it takes a long time. Um, looking sort of less at the, ver the end game of everything, I would say you know there's a worst case scenario that of course could play out here along the way, which is the nuclear weapons uh, scenario that Steve mentioned. Um, here, Russia has said that if Russia's existence is threatened, it will resort to nuclear weapons. So presumably, if it ran out of um, regular conventional weapons and felt that it was really at this point of losing, which could then destabilize the country as a whole and lead to collapse, the use of tactical nuclear weapons could be on the table. It doesn't achieve much on the battlefield because it, it essentially is hard to control with the radioactive fallout and it's, and it's not something where you can really, there's not much to target. I mean, the Russians have been targeting civilians so they could do that, but it's, it wouldn't really result in a gain and there would be this kind of radioactive cloud that could actually cover all of continental Europe and certainly could affect the Russian soldiers as well and Russia. Yeah, so, so it's, it is sort of really a last resort and it is a, it's a worst case scenario. I think to achieve something that might be a better path um, to the end of the war and the defeat of Russia, um, we would not want to see China cross that line into providing weapons um, that would replenish. Right now, Russia has to rely on, on 
Iran and North Korea, um, which is not much to sort of contend with, uh, but it's still keeping Russia afloat here. But there would also have to be continued dialogue because I think even with, with Russia being almost completely untrustworthy, you still need to have lines of communication, particularly when it comes to nuclear weapons. Getting the global south to be stronger in its support of Ukraine and condemnation of Russia is necessary. It's what Ole was referring to. But really, you know, if Russia finds these pathways, these alternates, these um, trade possibilities with other countries like India or China, it again keeps Russia going. So messaging on the part of the West has to be very clear about why this is wrong, why the invasion is wrong, and why it um, also affects everyone in the world, including people in Africa. It sets a precedent, again, for imperial colonialism, right? So I think the messaging has to be very clear about why this is wrong um, and to get the Global South really on board with everything. Um, keeping the U.S. together, which I think Steve already mentioned, uh, you know, the worst thing that could happen would be this partisan divide that leads to um, an, an unwillingness to continue to support Ukraine. Then everything kind of snowballs from there. Um, and then finally, I would say if, if there's more provision of, of military weaponry uh, to Ukraine to fight, that would help kind of end this quicker as well. So I often find myself lying awake at night thinking about Maya's worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know when the war ends. I don't know how it ends. Um, I, I think that one element we might want to also consider in thinking about you know, potential pathways towards peace or towards an end of the war is to, to look at Russian domestic politics and to look at not only what might happen over the next few months um, with Putin, with those who keep Putin in power, with those who could potentially challenge Putin uh, in his power, but also some of these broader themes amongst the public. You know, after the 2014 annexation, there was a lot of talk about whether this was an attempt on the part of the regime to build a, a stronger sense of Russian nationalism. Uh, and that theme has continued into 2022 and 2023. And there are major questions as to whether that was the case, whether that was successful, and what kind of consequence that has for the longevity of the war and for what comes next. Um, I will say the optimist in me thinks that when the war ends, I think Europe remains united. I think the transatlantic relationship remains strong. Uh, I think that there are going to be Im very important considerations, ones we haven't even anticipated yet, as to how to move forward in terms of NATO, in terms of the EU, in terms of the liberal international order. Um, but I, I am hopeful that those conversations will take place and that we'll, we will see another side. Um, I just don't know when. I'm going to try to build on that more positive outcome here as well. So again, with some of these key ifs, and the biggest one is if the U.S. stays the course of providing the support and the leadership it's provided in NATO and Europe to support uh, Ukraine to a point where Russia does lose the war, you know, a lot of good will come from that. Um, and the signal it sends to China about the risk of potentially it expanding, uh, going to places like Taiwan and so forth, that there is going to be a challenge, not just with the U.S., but the unanimity of the broader uh, European community. The bringing together of, of a functioning alliance is going to be critical for dealing with many of the other transnational challenges that we're facing that are existential, like climate change and how we move forward. The degree of international cooperation it's going to take to tackle some of the challenges we're facing is going to require a lot of grown-ups in the room focusing on those, those larger global goods not just their own parochial interest. And so this certainly has got everybody's attention. It is a lot that's destabilizing uh, about this unfolding. So leadership is really going to matter in the next uh, months and years. But if there's, I think, the success that could be uh, harnessed from this, it could really help us position us to deal with a lot of the other risks that right now seem to be so taxing to all of us. Thank you all so much. Um, I want to give us a few minutes at least to have some questions, if anybody has any. I know we're almost out of time, but feel free to raise your hand and I can come around. Um, I saw a hand over here first, so.
Um, thank you. So um, you said earlier about Ukraine being in this perpetual in-between land between. Is it working? Yeah, you can. You just speak loudly. That's just for the online audience. Oh, okay. Um, so, what would you think? What would you say the best strategy is for such land, which is between two geopolitical powers? Um, that are both trying to drag it to its side because the uh, the example Ukraine has showed us is because it kind of you know flirted with e EU um, or potential NATO membership that really um, I would say triggered Russian um, you know it, it was very alarming to Russia that it's losing its fears of influence and losing control. Um, so how, yeah, what would you think? Do you think having a very neutral um, sovereignty is is it even possible, or is that the best strategy to go forward without, like, you know, leading uh, to conflict? Yes. So, so Ukrainians have learned that there is no neutrality. In fact, I mean that's an illusion. You cannot be neutral. Uh, number one. Number two. No one has a right to claim a sphere of influence. If the people on that in that country don't want you to be, uh, you know, o their overlord, then you don't have any right to claim that, right? And so Ukrainians have chosen in 2014 when uh, there was a, a popular uprising called the Revolution of Dignity. They have chosen certain values, which are the rule of law, you know, no corruption, you know, the democracy, and so on, and that aligns with Europe, with or with the European Western broader values. And so the kind of the aspiration has always been to go that way. Uh, there has never been very strong support for NATO in the country because people on, on the one hand didn't really know what NATO was until now. Now it kind of revealed itself. On the other hand, the kind of desires were very natural. People wanted security, stability. They wanted really, you know, to be able to uh, have kind of uh, justice in courts and so on. And that's not what Russia offers. You know, y Russian speakers in Ukraine have been freer or in the last 30 years than Russian speakers in Russia <laughs> have ever been. You know, no one wants that. Russia does not offer anything that is attractive. What has Russia produced that you would clamor over? You know, not even like as a consumer product or anything. Nothing. There is nothing there. You look there and there is nothing attractive there. And so the question is that, you know, the reality is that people didn't want to go the same way that Russia went, didn't want to be with Russia in this because they knew what it means. And how, how we know that is from the history of over 300 years of various alliances with Russia that were later used as a way to under, undermine and subjugate Ukraine, to prohibit Ukrainians from speaking Ukrainian, to prohibit them from writing in their own language. Imagine if you had uh, from, from day one to day two start speaking French simply because the French came in and said, oh, stop, <laughs> I'm your overlord, you're my f uh, sphere of influence, you all stop speaking English, start speaking French, that's it. You know, don't teach your kids, don't send them to school where they can speak English and so on. That's what we experienced. Uh, I don't think, I think NATO as such was just a pretext. Uh, you know, Germany and France have blocked Ukraine for decades. Uh, since 1991, basically, uh, you know, from any kind of real ascension to NATO, and perhaps Julie can respond to that as well. But the reality is that it's just a pretext. Before, before that, you know, the the more real uh, threat was uh, integration with the EU, and so when the association agreement was signed in 2015, that's you know that's when really things got serious. And so, but we, c I mean, we can talk about this more. But the reality is there is no neutrality. As such, I think the best choice for anyone is to join a block that corresponds with your values and what your people want. You know, stick with it and be ready to defend your choice. There were some questions over here. Okay, uh, this is directed especially towards you, Professor Flynn. Um, with with kind of like the growing divide between China and autocracies and, and the West and democracies. Why wouldn't China supply weapons to Russia in exchange for, you know, the guarantee of oil and gas in the future? I think the big reason, and, and this is a little bit why I think the sort of the new China, U.S. China is the next Cold War. I think that rhetoric is a bit overblown. Really because for the last 30 years, our economies have become so deeply interdependent and the fate of the Communist Party is tied to its economy. And so, yes, it needs energy, you know, to keep that going.
and it's getting a great deal right now from the Russians on, 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 on that part. But to the degree that basically it is seen increasingly as an ally of Russia by putting weapons in, dragging the war out, creates not just a backlash with the U.S., but with Europe, it's hard to see how its economy, uh, which is all export-based, you know, is really going to be able to perform. So I think the reality is, you know, they're, they're much, China has always been much longer-range thinking, and so, you know, and it, 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 it is not just looking at the military kind of situation on the ground right now, but where the long play is. I think had Ukraine folded very quickly, we'd be in a much different place because that message would have been to China that, hey, you can get away with uh, more military expansionism. So I do think there's a check because of the economic interdependency. Now, of course, as we know, we're now in more of a trade war with China and those in part because of the friction. So this is, this is going to be choppy times. But right now, I, I, I think cooler heads are prevailing. It's not to say that could shift in, you know, anytime soon here, but uh, I'm expecting they're kind of just going to play the game a bit without going all in. Um, my first question is actually directed to the first speaker. Um, my family is from Odessa. Um, my mother came here when she was 14, and when she came, I feel like our Ukrainian identity was completely stripped. They forgot Ukrainian almost, and since the war, they've been relearning it, but my grandparents were convinced they were Russian for so long because of the Russian media. And with the war, I just, like as a first generation Ukrainian or Ukrainian American, it's so hard not to get emotional when talking about this, but I feel like we're not only being killed, but erased. And I feel like I'm doing so little in order to fight against that, especially because I don't know the languages and I feel like so much of my culture has been stripped from me. So I, I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give to first generation Ukrainians or Ukrainian Americans who want to take back who they are, who want to regain an identity and who want to actually make a change and help. Thank you. That's, um, I'm very touched. Thank you <laughs> for this question. My aunt right now and my, my cousin, they actually are in Odessa and kind of reporting from the ground about the bombings and everything. And so it's, uh, it kind of strikes very close to home. Um, it's, I, I think, th I hear that very often, like, what can I personally do? You know, and there is a lot that you can do. You can be an activist. You know, you can advocate for, for the issue with the kind of the political powers here in the state or even go to the national level. You can also do something very practical and educate your own, uh, you know, friends and family about the issues and so on. And for yourself, um, so uh, uh, I've been in my position at the Ukrainian Institute at Harvard for five years, and we have felt this kind of demand for learning more about Ukraine and Ukrainian identity. And so we have launched a new series uh, that is called the Harvard Series of Ukrainian Literature. And so we are bringing out uh, slowly some of the most remarkable works from right now, as well as from the past, uh, some of the best literary works. So I would recommend you to kind of look it up. Uh, also, just get a history of Ukraine. Serhii Plohi is a good uh, author, for example, or Serhii Yakelchuk also very good uh, you know and just kind of try to learn more and uh, honestly to all of you Ukraine has a very rich history because uh, of how it is uh, you know where it's located how, how many people and various kind of nationalities and ethnicities and linguistic backgrounds live there and um, uh, you are absolutely right that Russia has been going uh, uh, after Ukrainian identity why bomb uh, theaters why bomb museums I mean, whole museums have been raided and, uh, you know, artifacts that pertain to Ukrainian history and culture have been stolen and are supposedly safeguarded on Russian territory right now, right? There have been writers of children's literature killed, you know, for no of a silicon, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, you know, so it only makes sense if you understand that what they're really fighting for is not a piece of land, but to erase a certain identity. That's why Putin's proclamation before the war started was that, oh, we are one and the same people. I mean, no, we are. We never felt that way <laughs> and we never will be. <laughs> so you can try as you might, but we will resist that, right? And so what you can do is, uh, you know, to educate yourself about your history, uh, you know, your family history even, you know, and educate others, you know, such as your friends and, and, and colleagues here.
Um, I know you guys kind of touched on this already a little bit with the last question, but um, more specifically looking at smaller countries, both in Southeast Asia and towards Eastern Europe, should they be concerned about other uh, authoritarian regimes and powers getting emboldened by these actions and seeing that, um, like, they've, uh, that this war has been going on for so long that uh, they too might be next on this list in the face of the new world order that's coming about with the growth of China and Russia in that sphere of influence? Um, I think that's a really great question. Thank you. And I, I would say that if anything, the lesson is that if you behave like Russia, you're going to be met with strong resistance and reaction. So this is kind of what's giving China pause, right? In, in addition to what's going on in Russia, China is thinking about its aggressive plans in Asia. And many leaders have been going to Taiwan to emphasize their support for Taiwan. Um, so I think China gets this kind of lesson through something that's happening in a completely different area of the world. And one thing to think about as well is when you're looking at authoritarian powers, like China, it's not just about you know what is in its strategic interest, like your question, um, in order to have energy from Russia. You know, it's it's the fact that at the end of the day, China and Russia have very little in common. They just have authoritarian leaders who want to remain in power domestically, but they don't share ideology beyond that. It's not an alliance that can hold. Whereas the democracies of the world actually do share a vision of of the international world order. So I'm actually pretty positive about you know, this question of is it going to spread, that, that actually it's probably not going to spread because the reaction defied Putin's expectations entirely, right? He really has lost on multiple levels. Um, so I think that is actually a hopeful story. So I, I would just, the key caveat is that, again, the U.S. continues to play the role it's been playing. Because if, in fact, I mean, the, the one fear early on was the U.S. would get mired down in the Ukraine, therefore not able to keep up in the Pacific. What it's demonstrated so far is that, as we've seen, the Secretary of Defense recently in the Philippines, the degree to which uh, many of our, our, our Southeast, and, uh, Southeast Asia countries and all, of, again, are recognizing this risk. And so that game is sort of going up. So far, we've been able to keep them together which just makes this, uh, you know, one of the things that played out here recently, if we can't take, keep control of our own border, for God's sakes, what the hell are we doing over in Ukraine? I mean, you know, the United States is a great power. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. And if all we are doing is focusing on the border with Mexico, you know, we are not a first world power at any stretch. So we got to deal with that risk but we got much bigger game to be uh, uh, waged on here. And so that kind of rhetoric that plays it as an either or, you know, very much, of course, would be emboldening to uh, say, well, if America's sort of retreating, then yeah, we can, uh, we can mess around with our own neighborhoods, in our own neighborhoods. Um, I guess that kind of just leads to my next, like, my question, which is obviously, like, people are worried about the next presidency by 2024. So, you know, like, if we get a president that doesn't really align with the same views as Biden with supporting Ukraine um, and the U.S. does end up not, you know, giving as much funding or, you know, military weaponry in the future, um, does that mean that Ukraine has a chance of falling, that Russia could potentially win? So I can speak to at least part of that question. Uh, you know, as a scholar of U.S. foreign policy, there are a couple of things that we know. We know that um, presidents tend to be more consistent once they're elected than when they are campaigning. So when we look across, um, even if we go back to to George W. Bush, when we look from Bush to Ob uh, to Clinton, or sorry. Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden, even if we went back to Clinton in the 90s, which I realize most people probably in the audience don't remember, um, <laughs> we find a lot of consistency. We certainly find areas of disagreement. We see divergence from um, certain precedents in some areas, but we also see a lot of consistency. The other thing that 
I think is important to keep in mind. And, and, you know, the jury is still out how much public opinion really matters. But the public has been paying attention in the United States to what has happened in Ukraine. Certainly some of that attention has been drawn elsewhere since February of 2022. But that is significant. There's a small vocal minority, I think, of members of Congress who are have concerns about um, what's happening in Ukraine and the U.S.'s contributions to that. But I think, again, they will remain a minority. And I think that that is in part because of the, the scale and the scope of the U.S.'s contributions. It's certainly significant when you look at it in comparison to the to the NATO alliance and to the individual allies. Um, but what what the United States has contributed to Ukraine is is a fraction of its um, some would say exorbitant military spending and defense spending. So it, there's there's a lot to be lost and very little to be won by walking away from Ukraine um, politically as well as, um, you know, just materially, again, economically, militarily. Um, so I, I think that that maybe speaks to part of the question. And then, you know, if we were faced with the unfortunate circumstance that the U.S., um, were for some reason to draw down its contributions or to desire to move away from Ukraine. I think the last year has taught us that the European allies do remain committed to one another and they do recognize this as an existential threat to their well-being. So there's a lot of political support for them to continue higher levels of defense spending to, as Maya said, um, you know, refocus their attention on conventional threats as well as some of these non-conventional or non-traditional threats, uh, some of these larger threats, like Steve mentioned, of climate change. Um, and so I think that they will remain committed um, in the unlikely event that the United States doesn't. But I think that the, the probability of that is, is quite low. Let's just take a quick, see if there's an online question. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions on the live stream. Uh, one of the questions on the live stream is, what are the implications of a more proactive China with regard to the conflict? Could a more assertive Chinese foreign policy affect EU-American relations, especially in the economic sphere? You want to take it on? <laughs> All right, I, I, I can do it. Uh, there's a lot here, of course, to try to unravel with, the, uh, with where China is emerging as, you know, not just as a dominant economic power, but increasingly the investment in the military side. And it seems that it's you know, committed to that kind of trajectory. And going back to my concerns that I talk about, you know, we're in a, still in a nuclear age and that nuclear age is getting much more dynamic. Uh, clearly China's investment in new nuclear weapons and new we we well, weapons overall, you know, raises its threshold of being a greater power and uh, from a military standpoint. And that is something that is gonna continue probably to shape its ability to uh, potentially uh, act in uh, ways that are uh, disruptive. So, you know, the, the, the real challenge for it, though, is, again, that economic dependency it has, the sheer challenge it has with the West on issues like climate and, uh, and its ability to essentially hold power is built around, you know, something it's never not had in the last 20 plus years, which is a GDP that keeps climbing like this. And so what happens when it, it flattens or goes down, you know, I think that's, that there's real issues about China's stability at that point and I, how it can hang on to that trajectory. So uh, it is a real challenging time. Uh, that is the bottom line. We need all the best minds like we've got here, here working on it here because many of the, uh, you know, the, when I go back to my undergraduate education a long time ago, you know, the Cold War was pretty tidy all in all, with all that comparison yeah. here, you know. <laughs> Most of the thinking was done in the 1950s and it was just sort of around the margins after that. Uh, so we're in a much messier world right now and it just seems to keep going that way more and more. And it just, you know, really reinforces that uh, you've got to understand not just the regimes, you've got to understand, you know, different languages and culture, we've got to understand the economics, and we got all these things that you're hopefully learning uh, are going to be critical to trying to really make sense of the issues we have and to provide leadership on these issues as well. We have time for another question, and then I think we'll come back here. Um, you can 
Hi. Um, so I'm forgetting which one of you, and I'm sorry, but one of you mentioned um, private mili military contractors that are present um, within Russia and, you know, perpetually causing concern for a number of reasons. Um, so one of the other concerns that I've definitely noted in reading about the conflict is that the concern um, is the concern of, you know, in the event of a Russian collapse where there's like uh, certain regions that break off and become, you know, their own nations, um, that those regions would house nuclear weapons and it would be incredibly difficult to um, determine how they would behave with those nuclear weapons. So noting that one of you mentioned that PMCs could also be a complicating factor in um, any regional breakaway, how do you think that that would influence the state of nuclear politics. So, uh, if uh, so, based on the uh, Ukrainian experience, I think that those, uh, if 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 new nations emerge out of Russia uh, that are based on Russian regions that have nuclear weapons, I don't think they would g give up nuclear weapons no matter what, because the Ukrainian experience has been that you know you have three heads of state, you know Russia, the U.S., and the U.K. sign declaration that they will assure Ukraine's integrity and sovereignty and then one of those states attacks the country while others unfortunately Obama at the time does little to nothing right and so the reality is that the learning here is very negative for the nuclear non-proliferation regime in the world Ukraine has done something that no one really appreciated in the history of humanity and no one I think is going to do th to make that mistake anymore so if if those countries do emerge they will hold on to those weapons with everything they have of course unless there are very serious economic problems that can be resolved in exchange for them giving up the nuclear weapons and then the west or other countries investing uh in in their economic and social and otherwise well-being and integrating them and I think that's where also China comes in. And I think, in fact, China is a key player in all of this. China right now holds the key to kind of breaking Russian resistance because, uh, uh, you know, China ha has been a very important economic partner to Russia, uh, but it also could be a very, economic, a very important broker if it decided that it wanted the war to be over. Uh, it has that kind of line of communication, the kind of influence on Russia right now that the West does not have. Um, and so if, if a region falls away from Russia, for example, uh, you know, China could be uh, an important participant in those kind of negotiations. I guess I, I would say the overarching issue that we're wrestling with is that for much of the post-Cold War era, there was really agreement by the two dominant nuclear powers, the United States and Russia, that proliferation was against their interest. And China, pretty much went along with that as well. I mean, it was working its way into the club, but it really did not want anybody else in the club. They liked it being an exclusive club, all right? And, and the objective was ultimately, ideally, to get them down, but no matter what, it was that exclusivity that pretty much animated the pressure for efforts around non-proliferation and counterproliferation. That is now gone. So, and, and your scenario sort of just exacerbates it all the more, right? There's now more new potential nuclear powers, and there's those who may now more aspire for powers. But what we no longer have is the, the folks who really were the dominant players basically getting everybody else to agree that you really don't want these things. And that's uh, something that I'm not sure we can put that genie back in the bottle again. Well, we are a, a few minutes after 6.30, so I want to see if any of the panelists have any final words they'd like to share, or? <laughs> I mean, I guess just on the nuclear weapon. Yeah. I have a slightly yeah. different opinion that we heard some pr pretty strong pessimism on the nuclear weapons regime. I think, yeah, there have been some setbacks, but that actually, you know, the whole history of the nuclear regime has been about countries voluntarily giving up these nuclear weapons. And now, with Russia threatening to use them, there's this increasing condemnation of the potential of the use of these nuclear weapons. If you want to overnight make the strongest anti-nuclear regime around, Russia just has to use one of these tactical nukes, and the whole world will certainly line up against that. So I think that the dynamics there about nukes is a little bit um, different than just kind of the calculation of self-interest and, and kind of national security and all of this. There is a taboo as well. All right.
Um, please join me in thanking our expert panelists here. <laughs> I know, I know there were a lot more questions, and so I think if you have questions you want to ask, you can probably come up and ask them. But it is past 6.30, and I know, I know you're all, you know, probably ready to go have dinner. So thank you. Thank you again for coming, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Gretchen.